Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another Ahead of the Curve show. Today, I have a very special guest with me uh, on a very special session of Ahead of the Curve. I've got Rafik Anadol. Rafik, welcome to the show. Hello, great to see you again. Hello, great hello. to see you as well. It's, it's been a while. It's been uh, a little over a year, I think, since yes. uh, we met in New York City. Yes. On your, your grand opening of uh, Machine Hallucinations? Yes, correct, in, in Chelsea Market in September. That's right, yeah. So Rafik, can you give us a little bit of a, your background, You know where you started and uh, how you ended up basically becoming one of the main pioneers of creating AI-generated art? Thank you, so I'm a media artist and director and I always explain that I'm using data as a substance, as a pigment, and painting with a thinking brush that is assisted by machine intelligence. So when I say that, it's a little bit, little bit sounds weird, but basically, I think since my start with this medium, I always use data and custom algorithms that is developed for the purpose of the narrative or the sculpture or the painting, and then try to narrate them in a way that is just different than our maybe everyday life technological you know, communications with our tools and things. So um, I started my journey very roughly nine years ago, I guess. Very first, my data sculpture in the public space was in 2011 in Istanbul, Turkey, where I was born in and developed my first baby steps of education and understanding technology, medium, media arts, architecture, mission intelligence, like very, very like, I mean, early steps. And then uh, 2011, I got my second MFA degree in visual communication design. And previously, I got my degree also in photography, videography, and visual communication design. And around those days, I was very um, active in the European scene of media arts, art science and technology, and had many mentors that allowed me to like think about the future of media arts, the future of arts, future of architecture. And in general, I think I was always inspired by science fiction, just simply. <laughs> <laughs> as I think a lot of us uh, all have as well. So what have been some of your biggest challenges and basically, you know, um, in what you've been doing and what you've been creating? So I think, honestly, I had this desire of like being able to imagine, okay, first of all, arts for me is humanity's capacity of imagination. And I think this capacity has to be pushed to the edge. And I also found that pushing not only the edge of imagination is enough, pushing the edge of technology is also important. So when you have these two edges and when they collide, the serendipity just happened in the very center of this universe. And, and to make this universe more, I mean, visible, to make invisible more visible, I found that it's not a one-man job at all. So I am now a team of 12 people that I'm very proud to say that in Hill Los Angeles, California, which was a dream to have a studio of wonderful people who are also in the same mindset and looking for a future together. Um, so I'm not alone. So that's one number one thing. <laughs> you are absolutely not alone in Los Angeles. That is for sure. <laughs> so that really helped me a lot to like push this Im imagination much more uh, heavier and deeper and more meaningful. Um, now we are architects, engineers, AI engineers, visual designers, computer graphic um, professionals, neuroscientists, anthropologue, like storytellers, scholars, academics, like it's really like a, the idea of like being able to dream together this, this, you know, this, this alternative realities, let's say. Um, but our primary medium is always data and big data if possible, and never worry about the egocentric data, which is very important for me, because for me, art should be for anyone, any age and any background. And this statement is very heavy because it doesn't belong to egocentric expectations. It's more about like our collective imagination, collective perception, collective consciousness, collective memories. So I'm, that's why I'm very inspired by the idea of using AI in general to speculate a future that really belongs to all of us, not just a bunch of us. So I'm just like trying to find a common language with the arts. So what, what basically inspired you or what moved you to being fascinated about uh, artificial intelligence? I think the very easy answer is I was eight years old and I watched Blade Runner. The movie that changed my life. It was a very direct. <laughs> and, and I think it was, this, I mean, very sad that I didn't know English when I was watching it because my mom just randomly always like gets, rents these VHS cassettes and in Istanbul. And then one day she just got Blade Runner and there was a beautiful like Asian face and a flying car, that epic poster on the VHS. And I just put it and just watch it. And I remember very clearly 
it was just most inspiring moment that you have this vision of Los Angeles, which we are in right now, one year ahead. But um, still, like seeing that feature of this Los Angeles, like understanding that there's this two or maybe more than two, um, like uh, androids, like they are trying to communicate with the narrative, the idea of memory, like implementation of like memories, and, and this all things like really inspired me. And the same year, I got my first computer, Commodore 128. Which yep. I, started- I, I remember those days. Mine was a, a Texas Instruments TI 994A. And that's where I started playing games and never quit playing games. And then <laughs> <laughs> you're still playing games. Yes, very much. StarCraft, heavy StarCraft. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's I think how I started like thinking about like, can a machine learn? Like, can it dream? Like, can it become a partner, a friend? A, a tool like this, this, I think ideas always in my mind, but, but I think my journey especially is more fresh because I was very fortunate to work with uh, one of the earlier pioneers of AI algorithms, which really opened my mind. Thanks to those people. But also what was very inspiring for me at least, or also fresh was how we can embed media arts, mission intelligence into architecture to create new narratives. So I think that was another like, you know, unique, of this journey's uh, first steps. Well, I noticed a lot of the works that you do too are taken from photographs. And I know that you've got a very uh, fond heart of photography. Yes. And, uh, you know, nature and scenes and urban scenes and urbanism and things like that around you. Um, you know, what, what are the main pieces that have inspired you over the time in your photography? I think it's a great question. And honestly, I was very alone in the very early beginnings of my, but first of all, I was just very inspired by architectural photography because I thought that the best way of, I mean, first of all, I think photography itself is one of the most honest way of like representing memory that is like more, uh, in a, in a time frozen time frame, of course, the time domain is very limited, but the idea of saving a moment in life that you can capture it with the Ansel Adams zone system or like the large format photography. Like I'm just talking about the purest, not manipulated, the raw light exposed to the film, the substance, like that moment. I was super inspired. But then I also think that, I mean, from like Magnum, I was very, by the way, lucky to work with Martin Parr and many other like uh, Magnum photos, uh, early uh, artists. I was inspired by Ben Hila Beher, uh, Jules Schulman, like the people who have been like really capturing the architecture incredible way. But also I enjoy that you can froze a time and space and create a new abstraction of time and space with this photography. And then I learned videography, which I got much more inspired. The things we <laughs> and then I learned about generative design and the computer graphics and things with like much more inspired. And then 3D design and then like, you know, add on top of each of them carefully instead of just, you know, start directly with computer graphics. Uh, that I think allowed me to like understand the light, the shadows, the, the, I mean, the computation required for like, you know, computer graphics, fundamentals of 3D design. Like, I mean, all the thing, all of them grow carefully, um, I think. And what was really, I think, inspiring was around those days, like photography was an, an input for also AI, which is I'm doing a lot of my works last four years. So first of all, two, four years ago, 2016, I was the first artist in residence at Google's Artists and Mission Intelligence Group. It was a program and designed for artists like me who are working with data, who doesn't know how to use AI. So I'm not a computer scientist, I'm a pure learning to learn person, but I was inspired by the medium itself. And the 2015, the first deep dream, Google just arrived and people were like getting crazy about what is this like faces, this, this animals and this, this hallucination <laughs> of them. But it, and for me, it was just so predictable because I knew that machines can hallucinate. But I couldn't like, you know, prove that kind of thinking. Like, oh, that's finally, you can talk about this. Um, and of course, it's a speculation. Of course, machines doesn't decide yet. But if machine push to be learned some sort of an information, that information can also have a quality of dream or hallucination. So that was my really inspired part of the journey. And 2016, Archive Dreaming is very first art project in public space using AI in a library. And that project, I think, really put us into the like, you know, AI realm. And yeah, I would say that one shot you guys off into space. I think I think that was the uh, the most uh, inspiring. Again, thanks to Mike Taika, my mentor at Google, and Kenrick McDowell, who were the like AI curator, and Vasav Korten, who was the leading the uh, library in Istanbul called Salt. 
So since then, I didn't stop thinking about the archives, the images. Like there was 1.7 million images in that project, but then I just learned that what happens if you add different data sets, like collective memories, the nature, the Hubble galaxy, like the galaxies in Hubble, ISS from the Earth, or like MRO from the Mars, or like the city of New York, Berlin, uh, I mean, Stockholm, uh, Seoul, uh, Los Angeles, like <laughs> it just clouds and like it just, it, it just grows. So then I, I learned that, okay, each of them can become an individual dreams or, or hallucinations. And each of them is, there is no human. It's all about our, like what we as humans looking for. So that's like the, I think, inspiration. I think that's a wonderful inspiration. I know for me, when I was designing a lot of work, I would always, uh, whenever I got kind of a writer's block or designer's block, so to speak, right, I would go outside and walk around and just get inspired by the way, the way the wind would ripple, the way wind would hit things. Uh, just a lot of the things from nature and pulling all of those beautiful aspects of nature back in. And, yeah. you know, I'd look at something and all of a sudden that light would go off and, you know, I would go back in and jump on my computer and, you know, continue where I left off. That's true. That's true. And, and having, think, sorry, go ahead. And, and I think the nature is one of the most inspiring, like, I mean, medium of humanity, like the reality. <laughs> It's just incredible, and then I, I just, I, I don't know, the, the most inspiring thing ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, without a doubt, and that's the one of the beautiful things as well uh, about everywhere in the world and traveling and seeing all these different things and experiencing these different moments and experiencing these different cultures. You know, there's just so much that this world has to give, and so many things that, in a lot of ways, we actually take for granted. You yeah. know, uh, especially now where we're all locked in our homes <laughs> and not traveling very far, going very far. And very openly, that was an inspiration. Like once the like COVID-19 started, like when I learned that all things are postponed, canceled, and no more travel, the first thing I just imagined, how can we use AI to go space that we cannot go? Like how we can reimagine spaces that we cannot like, you know, touch or be there. And then immediately we start to like, you know, edit um, our data set of like nature dreams, like which is every single like data sets we can like hold is nature. I mean, what happens if we have all the national parks, like Iceland, European landscapes, Asian landscapes, like you name it. And then, and then put them together as a one holistic data sets and let AI to learn and dream those spaces that do not exist, but may exist. So it was really, yeah, the, so I see Shannon, my good friend Shannon. Hey, Shannon, thanks for watching the show. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Shannon is mentioning that data and metrics are an important part of the current condition uh, from tracking infection to electoral outcomes and business calculus of the ec economic roller coaster. As artists and technologists working at this convergence of data and creativity, what impact do you think we can have through the visualization of this information on society? And what creative inspiration have you found from these times? That's a great question, Shannon. Yeah, really super deep and, and, and hard to answer immediately. But I want to just say something. First of all, I'm super inspired by science fiction. I think in general, remembering the future is one of the most inspiring act. So, and I think what I am imagining is, this is a kind of an act of remembering the future. So it's not maybe directly like touching it or creating it, but it's becoming just more closer to what may happen soon. So it's kind of a cautious material, a kind of a reflex, reflex design or reflex, reflex of, you know, society, let's say. Like we just, I mean, sometimes in the human, human history, we do not have a chance to like think the things comes in front of us and we have to deal with it versus now maybe we may have a chance to like go ahead and then see somehow what may happen and predict things and come back and maybe you know, ask better questions. So this never happened before too much before the technology is like accessible for anyone. For example, by the way, Philip K. Dick is one of my hero science fiction, I mean like William Gibson, but he said, reality is that which doesn't go away when you stop believing in it. A simulation <laughs> is that which doesn't stop when the stories go away. Stories are responsible to our human desire for resolution, but a, simu but a simulation is responsible only to its own laws and initializing conditions. A simulation has no moral prejudice or meaning like nature, it just is. I think it's an incredible statement about, from my humble perspective, what we do is simulation. They we are not real. 
and they are simulating the water, simulating a moment of remembering, moment of dreaming, moment of hallucinating. A machine takes over a building, or uh, um, uh, someone remembers the best day of their life, the worst day of their life. Someone emotionally feels connected to some past. Like it's a very like complicated to answer, but I'm what I'm feeling is these artworks or these moments of speculations are just reinventing those like simulations and and if the audience has the capacity of taking this as an inspiration or the capacity of asking more question he or she can or if there is no depth required for the given time and space that person can just enjoy the meditation i mean i think these are all very democratically available in the experiences but i don't know which one really makes sense for the common sense of humanity but my purpose is always I mean, in being impactful and purposeful when we are doing all these ideas, not just techno fetish bunch of, you know, cool algorithms or data sets. It's more <laughs> about like how we can, like how to bring depth to surface, let's say, is a, is a very, um, I think, I, I think the question comes, another question, how we can bring depth to surface with these tools and mediums that, that the people can have a much deeper understanding and the questions about what maybe the ramifications of a technology or potential inspiration of another like problem. Like when we understand intelligence in general, like can we apply different you know, rules and regulations to our society? I mean, this all like becomes a very big bubble of other questions. But yeah, I've had, a lot of, I've had a lot, of, a lot of comments and a lot of questions based around that as well. And a lot of that is focused around, you know, us as a community and us as a whole and putting politics aside yeah, you know, and um, I find that there's been a very big kind of disconnect between the way that we are as a society and the the leadership of our world. Yeah, and the one thing that I find is very interesting now is as we progress technology and we advance technologies, especially in the realms of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. what kind of impact is that going to have on us as a society as we push forward uh, in all different ways? I mean, it's it's a very like um, a, a beautiful, I think, uh, problem sometimes because I think in general, again, maybe it's a cliche answer, but I think it's like the same as like the the fire, right? When we when we get the fire in our hands and as as humanity, we just cook with it, create a communities around it, and the same technology became a tool to destroy each other. Like it's, I think it's a very similar vibes here in the AI context or quantum computing, it doesn't matter. I think eventually the technology itself is there to make, you know, communities, I mean, solve other bigger problems or create more problems. I think it's just like literally, <laughs> literally we have the same chance. It doesn't, it doesn't change as humanity. I mean, are we getting smarter? I don't think so. <laughs> but do we have a chance? Yes. And much more than before. Um, but again, it's a very collective, again, imagination, I guess. This, this I was, sense. yeah, absolutely. I find it's like a balance. It's a scale. We, all, we have all, everything sits on scales. And you take the good with the bad on everything. But in the end, it all kind of balances itself out, you know? And it's the same way that we deal with everything on a on a day-to-day -day life basis. And the same way that we deal with everything throughout our lives as we come and go. Good things happen. Bad things happen. We learn. We digress we go backwards you know it, it's it's life <laughs> absolutely and i think it's a beautiful journey but also comes with i mean this beautiful like you know serendipity so i mean j, j. wright For forster says like humans develop a mental model of the world based on what they are able to perceive with their limited senses and the decisions and the actions we make are based on this mental model so at the end, we have a mental model of understanding who we are and our consciousness based on that. And eventually, when you use a machine intelligence to simulate these scenarios, it's not anymore too much sci-fi. It's honestly simulating it in a way that is in a humble way, of course. You can see some patterns that are interestingly similar. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can see patterns all the way through life. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a, a big... I guess uh, evangelist of sci-fi and you know techno music and and all kinds like basically anything anything that's relatively close to some sort of art form whether it's audio or visual or or um, basically anything and you know it's it's quite incredible 
some of the things that we pull out of those uh, those feelings and those those different gauges and measurements um, of these technologies. And I remember one album; it was it was called Pi, and a lot of it, you know, was basically um, it was a collective of, of different artists from the movie Pi uh, back in I think it was like the '90s, early '90s. I remember watching it and I was like, oh my God, like, wow, that was so different. And the music was very different. You know, I had music from Aphex Twin on there. And, you know, it was way out there at the time. And it really just opened my eyes to a whole different world. And it was kind of one of the areas that I really started to uh, embrace and see the world in a more kind of digital, digital way in a digital fashion. Um, David Forsey is asking a question here about uh, Runway ML, which I yes. actually used recently. And yeah. it, he was wondering if you could, if you had any tips. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, very good question. So first of all, um, what happened again four years ago when I did my very first training of those, you know, algorithms, which were very different than like, let's say, I mean, four years, it's just, I don't know, it's very weird to say, but anyway. Um, so four years ago, training again uh, with a limited data and assuming it will learn something without overfitting was something like really, you know, ambiguous. But now style GAN, style GAN2, um, or DC GAN, or Pro GAN, and Cycle GAN, there's a no, many, many opportunities. So Runway ML is, only allowing you to go to, I think, 512 pixels, if I'm not wrong, in latent space walks. But it, I, I think you can create latent walk through the P5GS. I remember there's a way of like connecting latent space walks through the third-party API connection. I, I'm not sure, but it's doable as far as I remember. But from my perspective, things get much ambitious. So we need to develop a new software. There wasn't anything existing. And we, I mean, I was very, I, my desire was, honestly, putting a camera in the mind of a machine, like since the last four years. And in the early days, of course, that was a bigger concept because one of the problem is like latent space is a concept of like multi-dimensional, like multiverse level thinking, like you can't feel and see that universe of multiple dimensions, right? So our approach was how we can, um, uh, yes, Daniel Shipman, I think so, I saw it. But what I was much inspired is like how we can really simulate a camera in that space, not just, you know, make a random walk or some, you know, certain latent pics. To make it happen with, thanks to friends at NVIDIA, by the way, like, thanks to, like, the, the, the team that allow us to push these boundaries way, like, I mean, two years ago with the first RTX was just arriving with mm -hmm. Jensen and the team. We were the first, by the way, uh, able to use the RTX algorithm in Unreal Engine in, in Gamescom in, in uh in Germany, but what was really inspiring around those is like talking with the engineers and like how we can really put this camera in that universe that we can buy a joystick, like a game pad, fly this universe and find a meaningful point, another meaningful point, another meaningful point and create a journey in between those potential spaces and let the machine imagine in between. So that was like, again, now maybe four years of dream, but four years finally, ago. So now we have this uh, new custom app, let's say in TensorFlow, heavily like, I mean, uh, we basically we can run a model in real time. We can plot the samples from the what machine learned. Let's say we have a GAN algorithm, style GAN2, let's say we plot, let's say 100,000 samples from this universe, data universe, and then take those samples and put them in a one universe, which is also a machine, um, sorted, let's say, by using VGG16 and VGG19 right now, we cluster those images based on their similarities, and then map the latent space into a three-dimensional space where you can fly in this between these two worlds, if it makes sense, in a high level. So that's how I create those latent space walks, because otherwise I couldn't find a truly narrative in this universe. And I, that's why I call it latent cinema recently, because it's a cinema that doesn't exist unless you ask the question. So that's that's how I do uh, latent walks. That makes a lot of sense too, and it it helps with uh, being able to create the narrative and create the journey. By the way, I wish I could show you all, but normally we had this old presentation ready for the GTC and SIGGRAPH. But I think in SIGGRAPH there will be another maybe talk about this, and we are hoping to share lots of details of this algorithm 
and the and the pipelines very soon also um, almost there. And we have some surprises too, as you may guess. <laughs> Technology is constantly changing, and uh, yeah, that would be that would be awesome. So I wanted to ask to um, actually before I continue asking, I wanted to thank the viewers again for for being on the show. I wanted to give a quick shout out to Holly, uh, to Andrew, Hello. and to everybody watching the show. Thank you guys for so much for your support and being here with us today. Um, but Rafik, I also wanted to kind of you know dig a little bit, dig a little, little bit. Um, from where you where you started, mm -hmm. and what were some of the um, technologies that you were tinkering around with or experimenting with that really got you in? Was it the experience that you had at Google? Uh, was it TensorFlow that opened things up? I, I, think, um, I think a little bit way before that. I mean, honestly, what was really inspired me was really the custom software development options, like literally 2009. I was so happy to like work with this VVV, it was a software that is now available to be like used freely, which was my very first way of like learning how to use custom software development ideas. So like it was like a vertical design, like a flow of like visual programming language, which I am now using for last 10 years, I guess, or nine years. This software was my first like, I think, inspired imagination model. But in TensorFlow, of course, things get much interesting because I mean I'm a medium maybe Python user, but the if if you are not creating your own neural network from scratch, you don't need to be a computer scientist anymore. You can just play play with the existing models, tinker with the existing like available algorithms, work with the available like you know tools that are designed for some ML um, ap applications, right? So that universe opened for me four years ago. Uh, and I think Mike Taika, again, who was a wonderful mind, who really like explain and you know, explore together these ideas and I mean, learn together, basically. I mean, TensorFlow is yes, but also I think I'm more inspired by the results of this process. Like the process itself is exciting, yes. What, how machine learns, what may it learn, like when it fails, what happens if it fails more, it's, it's very exciting. But my desire was how can we create this pigment? Like how we can turn these machine decisions into a brush strokes? Like how we can turn this brush into a thinking brush? Like that part was just a little bit beyond the process, but adding a new ideas on top of that. So that's why computer graphics for me was always an inspiring thing. Like now nine years, I'm heavily nerding with like fluid <laughs> dynamics, uh, like optical flows, noise algorithms, like Ken Perlin's, like I, re I remember 46 line of his very first Perlin noise code. Like I remember, I, I memorize it like that level obsessed because I think it was really inspiring to be able to like recreate a mountain, sky, ocean or landscapes from a scratch. It's just so godly, but it's so makes sense. And then when you like, uh, so you, I, I don't, I didn't only like enjoy two dimensional GAN world, but how we can, you know, reinterpret the architecture of spaces, like architecting of perception, architecting of mission intelligence, like they become much more inspiring eventually. Uh, so eventually like those algorithms really opened my mind more than I think just ML itself. So what about uh, expanding those and, and bringing those onto a larger scale and to, into larger formats? You know, what, what have been some of your biggest challenges in creating large format uh, algorithms or large format, working on large format canvases? So that's a very good question. So I, had, I think so far we had three large canvases. The very first one is Walt Disney Concert Hall project, which is Frank Gehry's beautiful building, LA Philharmonic's home here in Los Angeles. Um, we have to use 42 4K projectors. Like it was an <laughs> enormous challenge. And we are not Disney. We are not Sony. We are not like, you know, big production. We had an art studio in Los Angeles with a bunch of GPUs, but doesn't mean we had to like, you know, but we have to compute this data eventually. So what yeah. was really challenging is that project in the beginning, 2018, uh, September, it took us a massive challenge to find a way to compute the data, organize it meaningfully, use real-time graphics, pre-rendered world, just a lot of challenge there. The second challenge was Mission Hallucination in New York. We had 18 4K projectors in a given time in a space in our tech house. That was another challenge, like multiple millions of like, you know, pixels with particles and 
insane optical flow work, like workflows. We 3D model the existing like neural networks, like just an, a just enormous data there as well to handle. But it worked. I mean, it's somehow it's challenging, but really it's it is doable. It just needs to be organized. Like again, I always thank you very much, Brandy. Uh, what, what is really very I think inspiring is. Even though we are an art studio, we are not a professional in honestly in movies or you know computer graphics. We just learn to learn, you know, like okay, how we can do that? Like how we can achieve this UV mapping of a, such a complex surface? How we can, you know, remodel this building? Because by the way, Frank Gehry's original model was like not available. So first of all, <laughs> so, just to throw something else into the mix. So 2002, the original Katia model unfortunately was repenalized by a company in New York and unfortunately they lost their files in a fire. The Gary, Te Gary Technologies was incredibly helpful. They shared their original Rhino model. But again, it's not designed for projection mapping. They are just, you know, great models of architecture. Doesn't mean you can use them directly, right? So we spent maybe two months of retopologizing, like reconstructing, for just a lot of work there. But I think, but that's how, how, how I think then you have a really purposeful idea of, turning architecture into a canvas, turning data into a pigment and use ML to glue them. Like really, otherwise, I don't think it will feel like just another, you know, projection mapping project. So those are the bottlenecks of, I think, imagination. Oh, and the sound, like sound itself is already very challenging. For LA Philharmonic, we had 77 thousands of individual sound recordings of almost 65 years of two hours minimum long amazing <laughs> recordings like just imagine this universe and, so, and the idea was how can we create an instrument that what a one click we can fly in the mind of a machine and hear every mahler every beethoven ever recorded every stravinsky is ever recorded and then heal and feel that moment so that was also impossible without ml right so I think the idea was always first, and then we found ML is the only way, if it makes sense. So if you know that balance, I think it's more purposeful and impactful. Otherwise, you are just in the mercy of a machine learning algorithm and waiting forever to like get some results versus there's a, there's a purpose of like journey. All right, we have to make this instrument, a historical instrument that can play every Mahler ever recorded in the 65 years. Like, you know, that, that kind of, you know, vibe. Um, those are very big challenges um, that I thought and yes, these are like really big challenges. And then recently for Mission Nation, we download 113 million images of New York. <laughs> and then <laughs> that was a big data, I guess. It's the largest data ever, as far as I know, and artwork is used from scratch. Um, and cleaning this data was an enormous process, like how you can find people, sausages, pizzas, <laughs> like selfies, and be sure it's not egocentric. It's like the buildings, the nature, the, the streets, like it was a really big challenge to clean this data and find the, you know, those images and train neural network with that. Um, so there, was that a manual process or? We have another classifier that we have like developed our own pipelines to be able to clean. Um, of course, we have some good and bad photo, of course, always, um, because we to, you need to train a neural network eventually. Yeah, you can't, you can't filter everything out. <laughs> yeah, but even though, we couldn't have all the success. So we have like spend more and more and more time cleaning data because very openly saying, we never show the original images or photos of what we did so far, unless it's not a GPL project, which is very proud to say there, the data is public, right? The NARS, the ISS, the like, I mean, Hubble telescope, that's something different. But for any public uh, collective memories, we never show the original, you know, the material. We always show what machine synthesize as an ethical you know, rule. Um, but that was also interesting, like how we can be sure ethically correct that there's no human, there's no privacy, like be sure like it's puke. Anyway, a lot of challenge there. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. I'd actually love to hear from some of the viewers, some of the artists that are watching the show. If you guys have tinkered around with AI, uh, some of the challenges you might have, some of the things that you've been working on, it'd be really uh, interesting to hear about what you have been doing as well. So, um, what, um, sorry, I just kind of completely lost my train of thought there for a moment. But speaking about, um, speaking about AI at its core, you know, back at Christie, we were trying to figure out ways, of course, working in real time and generative graphics 
to be able to create uh, networks and libraries that were fast enough to be able to compute in real time. And it was, it's, it's a real challenge to say the very least. I'm sure you've uh, probably yeah. tinkered around with it quite a bit yourself. I, I, um, I, I can show you one running real time here. Really? If you're interested. This is a, whoop, here we go. It's a, it's a LED media wall. I, ah, sorry, it's not, <laughs> it's not a, ah, maybe. Oh, there we go. So it's a square media wall, 1024 by 1024 style game to running real time. Like we have like this kind of experiments. I mean, yes, real time is very challenging for especially ML, ML world. Um, yes, but it, it's, it's doable too. <laughs> <laughs> so David is asking again, when do you see mach machine learning entering 3D space? Which I think is a great question. Uh, and where instead of processing archival 2D imagery, uh, you're processing something like 3D point clouds. Super, super great question. I think so far, I think the PyTorch 3D from the Facebook AI research has the most closest one. There's one MIT uh, group of people where, so the problem is the three-dimensional data is, so, I mean, we have a DJX station too that I think is a super computer for AI, uh, but I do not know really how we can do this soon, soon. Like, I mean, we have been trying a lot that, to get some meaningful artifacts, but honestly couldn't get anything meaningful yet. Um, the pipelines are available, but the results are not as exciting yet. I think, I am sure spaces like Facebook who needs avatar and face recognition, I am sure like they are very much into three dimensional games. Um, and I am pretty sure car companies who need three-dimensional construction of the world, they need game engines, they need, uh, because right at the end, it's all synthesized data sets, right? Um, but I couldn't see any really easy pipelines, let's say. Um, uh, it's, it's very costly in terms of like computation. Um, when you bring the third dimension, right? I mean, even RGBD is like a big, big, big data sets. When you bring the images, when you plot like the XYZ data points and they're most likely, if there's a color information in that universe, oof, like it's a big data. So, but it's a great question. I couldn't find anything that is really inspiring and available to be explored yet. But it's a big have, you been, uh, have you been exploring and, and playing around with any of the gaming engines like yes. Unreal? So as a studio, we have both Unreal and Unity in the game. So in Unity recently, in, for my TED talk, by the way, I have very fortunate to visualize the entire TED archives. If you're interested, everyone, on the 18th of August, I guess it will be live. Um, in, for the talk, um, I took entire TED archives and then you know, transformed into like a sculpture. And anyway, in there, we use Unity, for example, drive into this, I think, 7.2 million seconds of data sets of images with fly, with, with a connect real time. Um, so we are using Unity a lot for like, you know, ML visualizations. Um, for Unreal Engine, we use a lot of like, we were very lucky to work with RTX team at NVIDIA two years ago. Like we have, we have been like one of the first, you know, uh, group of people doing artworks with RTX. And we, had, we are doing a lot of AR, XR, VR works currently. Um, but Unreal is amazing. I mean, from my humble perspective that I found it more friendlier for my background, but I believe Unity is also incredible for people who knows how to navigate that landscape. Yeah, I find it's always, uh, again, kind of a give or take, and it, it really plays into your mindset onto how you, yeah, how you work and what you want to achieve and get out of it. And, and for our, for example, we have many pieces in the, in the collectors, collections, uh, and some collectors really specifically ask for real-time experiences. And we have, yes, versions that are running real-time, ever-changing. Uh, unless the, the, the hardware is up and running, I think the artwork is endless. So we have versions of them, uh, both running in Unreal, in Unity, and V4, VVV. Yeah, I was, uh, I was looking at some of the pieces that I'm not very familiar with from your studio, and I noticed that you guys have been tinkering around with um, interactive interactivity and being able to interact with the different yes. pieces as they're formed, right? Yes. So what have been some of those challenges that you've had in working with interactivity and AI? I think, I think again, this latent space, this exploring latent space itself is the most fundamentally challenging thing. Um, I don't think it's easy to solve and I don't think it is 
again, you need really high end gears and hardware. So we really work with this medium, first of all. Uh, Runway ML is something really explores, it allows you to explore things in, an, in a humble way, but in, in, a, in a deep research of, let's say, EEG data, fMRI data, like, I mean, image archives, sound archives, text archives, like it gets really challenging. And I think the hardware is a bottleneck very openly. Uh, and if you don't have the state of the art hardware, you are not as close to what you may speculate, you, what you may imagine or produce. That's annoying, <laughs> very openly. It's not democratic. So I wish yeah, all of us have the same similar tools, same like a mouse keyboard, you know, logic, like have the same authenticity of like touching the same things, but it's not that easy apparently for many years too. Um, but I think interactivity with latent space is so far the most inspiring thing because it's really endless. Like you don't know what you will see when you fly in that universe. You don't know what will it create, what it finds in big data. It's really very, very rewarding. The second in my, I think I am inspired by this idea of a machine can create a data universe. So 2016, when we started working with Archive Dreaming project, uh, Mike trained us to use uh, one of the early image recognition algorithms that can give weights and meanings to the um, the data sets, which is the three dimensional clusters of images. And then you can fly and explore these universes. So that's another interaction model we have developed for the state of Portland. If you go anywhere soon, Portland city's uh, building, we have a piece you can explore these, you know, archives in multi-touch screens. We have a connect like hands-free version, leap motion version. Like these are like really exciting interactive models of how we can explore this multi-million model of like space, basically. I think it's going to be really cool once you can completely interact uh, with a piece and then also interact with the AI as it's happening all in real time. I think that would be like the holy grail of yes. being able to, to achieve that because yeah. then you've got levels of complete reality mixed with basically all the power of ML yeah. at your fingertips, which is awesome. really, I think, going to be quite amazing when we get there. I don't think we're too far away. Yeah. So Shannon was uh, asking, sorry, just pop that off, but yeah. Shannon was asking, can you speak to the business model of working as a researcher and artist? Yes. And how do you temper commercial drivers from innovation and creativity? Yes, it's a great question. So I think, first of all, it was very hard to say in 2014 when we opened the studio right after graduation, it's an art studio. When you say art studio, you simply ignore the commercial world because art and commercial interests together do not exist for the collectors, for the society of arts, which I respect. And um, that was a hard decision, right? Like we don't move logos, we don't do things for products, we do arts. So that was a very hard decision. But I think what was really inspiring that once we were a pioneer of certain ideas, it's recognized by the tech giants, let's say. And when the tech leaders recognize the movements that we are able to open up with the limited resources, I think that created a new kind of a thinking for this, this, this group of people who are available to produce more artworks. Oh, sorry, commission more artworks. So I think that we create this ecosystem, I guess, with, our, with knowing or not knowing, but by inspiring for sure some people that are in charge of you know, making more. So basically, I mean, an artist normally works with, you know, like institutions that's normal since Renaissance, right? An artist can get the best pigment, best brush and paint with that. It's a little bit different. Like for us, I mean, we get the best GPU, the best CPU, the best, I mean, algorithm and the data sets and, you know, work with them to make art. Or sometimes the city of X ask for a collaboration or sometimes a university of X ask for a development of an idea for the purpose of good of creating an exhibition. Or a collector comes and says, I want this specific, you know, artwork in this wall or in this tree. Like it, or, or at a, it, I think it developed a new ecosystem of desire of like creating experiences. Um, that model was not designed, very openly saying. Uh, it's, it was all serendipitic journey and desire of finding new ideas, freshness, and it just, you know, developed these relationships. Um, there's zero purpose of your know, PR or um, like, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very big struggle because honestly, commercial work is something, it's, it's own, I think, entity as an entity as its own like rules and regulations and ethics and art world is also like described in a different mentality M my perp again i i think when you are not in the product imagination like creating a product experience 
you're suddenly in the different questions and you know limits or unlimitless like the world of imagination and that worlds are i think different um and keeping them different very openly saying this really helped me a lot like you have a clarity you have a pure clarity it's hard very hard because when you as a team i mean there's 12 people thinking together and there's a i mean financially everyone is a full-time members of this, <laughs> this journey I can't say I'm not commercial, but I cannot commercialize ideas. I cannot, I do not like work for that. I, if, if it doesn't have a value for society, it's okay. I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm an academician. I have, I'm a B plan. I, very good. I found a B plan, but, but the purpose of sharing at the end as an art or as an education is what I think fundamentally there. Um, even it's very hard, very open. It's not that easy as a business model. <laughs> I, I think that uh, that transition might be, becoming a little bit easier though, as the commercial and art yeah. fields really start to collide. Definitely. You're starting to see a lot more extremely, um, extremely creative, uh, creative installations and creative pieces that are being generated sure. and curated directly out of the commercial Absolutely. markets. I think the markets are already merged. I don't think they are independent, but what I'm saying is there are certain people collectors or museums and galleries they are specifically looking for a certain sharp clear artistic journeys let's say um while curating their selection i guess and that's where i have these dialogues a lot like specifically asking uh non-commercial approach the questions and the purpose and the impact if it makes sense yeah that absolutely makes sense Rafik, I'd really like to thank you for being on the show with me today. Um, how would our viewers be able to reach you or, or get more information from you? Again, thank you very much, Jeff. Like, it's amazing to be here. And thank you for everyone. Beautiful, thoughtful questions and dialogues. I'm available very much online. <laughs> like, <I'm laughs> Instagram, LinkedIn, <laughs> Facebook, Twitter. And my web page is there. And we have RafikandolStudio.com if you want to learn more about our structure and how many people we are, like what we do. RafikAnadolStudio.com is our more, um, not a corporate, it's a, true, it's a studio website, web page that you can see more structured like world. And I am personally really online behind my phone a lot. And <laughs> As we all are. <laughs> so you're very welcome to ping uh, from any, any social network. Happy to be in touch. Um, and uh, thank you again for the, Beautiful questions and and um, thank you for the again Jeffrey for being together for the purposeful questions. Oh, absolutely! No, absolutely. I wanted to ask you, um, out of all the pieces that you've created and that you've curated, what is the one that you hold dearest to your heart? What was the one that was let that is just it, it resides with you and I think sits with you all the time. I think. WCH dreams like the Frank Gehry's Disney Hall because it was a big dream like as a student when I come to this beautiful country and then I was just struggling like as a student what to do next and a dream in the mind like can a building dream can it hallucinate can it remember like that questions here it took like seven I mean six years almost to come to a location and see it and when it alive when a free public art project for anyone any age children dogs and cats like all that city like it was I mean, it was so magical, emotional, when you see that idea comes alive, that feeling, that was really powerful. That really sits on me, like in my heart and mind so deep. And um, I think that really feels different than many other projects. Well, personally, I can't wait to hear what you guys are gonna be creating and what's gonna be coming out of your studios here in the near future. I'm personally looking very forward to it. Hopefully I'll be able to uh, physically see it. Yes, hopefully we get rid of this thing soon, collectively, and succeed successfully, get healthy and open up the physical world, hopefully soon. That would be absolutely wonderful. Well, I just wanted to thank all the viewers for watching today. Um, and again, couldn't do it without your support. Uh, this Thursday, we're going to have my good friend Scott Riley on, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, transitions and career changes and basically exploring different uh, different elements, different realms of what you can do throughout your life and uh, the steps that you could take through your career. So please join us again on Thursday with Scott and Rafiq once again. Thank you so, so much for being on with us today. And for all of you watching, please stay ahead of the curve. Thank you.